The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Hello and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley, and with me tonight is Father William Jenkins from the Society of St. Pius V. He's also the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you? Fine, thank you, Tom. Good evening to you. How are you? Good, Father. Thank you for being here tonight. I know you've got a busy schedule. Well, there's a lot going on. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm. it's, it's good. It's good. It's all good. All right. Well, Father, I thought we could get to a couple emails. We have several in the same vein of asking questions about uh, newer saints that have been canonized in, in the new church. For example, here we start with Maximilian Kolbe, and this viewer says, in your opinion, would he be opposed to Vatican II and the new Mass if he were alive today? Do I think he would be opposed to it? Absolutely. Yes, I think he'd be horrified by it. I think he'd be horrified to see what has happened to the Church. In modernism, um, Maximilian Kolbe was not a modernist. Um, Quite the contrary, a very deep love for the faith, a deep love for our Lord, and uh, for the Blessed Mother, and he would be horrified to see what the modernists have done. Mm -hmm. um, he would have resolutely opposed the, the new Mass and the new sacraments, and I, um, there, there are quite a number of, of excellent figures, uh, saintly figures, who uh, died uh, in the lead-up to Vatican II, uh, we think of uh, even um, Father Reginald Garrigou Lagrange, the great French theologian, domestic theologian. Had he, uh, had he not died uh, just in the early 60s, it might have been 1960 itself, I'll have to check that out. But he would have been a, 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 a valiant opponent of Vatican II, would have denounced it. And his voice would have resonated throughout the world with Catholic people. Uh, he would have been a great champion for the traditional faith. So, um, you know, the, any of those who would be saints would, would certainly have opposed this, this Nova Soto, this new order. Yeah. Father, what about Archbishop Sheens? One, one of our viewers asked if you believe that we should venerate Archbishop Sheen. I don't. I don't know that we should. Um, you know, I, I guess they're preparing to canonize him, but they're also preparing to canonize Paul VI, too. <coughs> and they've also canonized some rather, um, I would sh say, actually shady, shady characters, right? Um, not only do I say that, but even some of the more conservative Novus Ordo um, voices also point out um, <clears throat> some very compromising canonizations that have taken place. And it's clear uh, that the motive for these canonizations is purely political, uh, to try to canonize the Novus Ordo is what they're trying to do. So, um, I would say there, there were some very saintly souls uh, uh, who, uh, for example, Padre Peel, um, I personally don't think there's any question that he uh, died in the grace of God, uh, as he lived in the grace of God, and that he is a saint in heaven. Um, he actually was a reproach to the Nova Soto, though. He had to be compelled under obedience to even uh, say a mass facing the people. Uh, it was the traditional mass, though, but even to turn the altar uh, toward the people uh, was a great cross for him. He died shortly thereafter. Um, they liked to picture him uh, offering that mass. They tried to give you the impression that it was the new mass, but it wasn't. Uh, that's uh, simply a falsification. It was the traditional mass that he was offering. Uh, so I, I believe that there are uh, saintly souls who, um, who died since Vatican II who have uh, been canonized by the Novus Ordo, but they are saints today 
uh, certainly not because they've been canonized by the Novus Ordo, but in spite of the fact that they've been canonized by the Novus Ordo, and the Novus Ordo has canonized them despite the fact that they're, saint, they're Catholic saints. But they practice, they live the traditional Catholic faith. Mm -hmm. The Novus Ordo is just trying to co-opt them and use them uh, to further their, their modernist ends. Mm -hmm. Father, another example of that would be St. Teresa's parents. Um, how, you know, they, they were recently canonized by Francis, I believe. Should we, should we be venerating them? Well, I mean, we can venerate them from the standpoint of the fact that we think that they are, personally, we think they are heaven. The fact that, again, that, that the Novus Ordo itself has canonized them. When I say the Novus Ordo, I mean um, John the Twenty Third, right? It was definitely a new order, right? It was definitely a new order. He's a pontiff of the new order, right? One of the creators of the new order. And uh, Paul the Sixth, and John Paul the Second, and right on down the line, um, we see a, a difference in the canonization process with John the Twenty Third, and that uh, the changes to the canonization process have continued unabated from John the Twenty Third right to the present day under Francis. Uh, the, 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 the direction of that whole process and its changes um, are to kind of, well, they use the expression dumbed down. They're, they're, they are meant to um, really require less and less, uh, not only in terms of heroic love for God, but to inquire, require less of any signs of heroic love for God, miracles and so on. Sometimes, you know, the miracles have been, have been reduced from four to two to one and sometimes zero, you know, because the Novus Ordo wants to canonize somebody, uh, make someone a poster child for the Novus Ordo. Um, they can even just eliminate the need for miracles at all. Uh, so this, this um, certainly shows the, um, the corruption of the whole process of um, canonizing saints in the Novus Ordo. Um, what they're looking for is uh, basically people who can, as they say, uh, give a veneer of respectability to the Novus Ordo. And sometimes I think they actually are canonizing real saints but they certainly are not saints of the Novus Ordo. That, that is uh, an insult to a real saint in heaven um, to claim that he represents the Novus Ordo. He was not sanctified by the Novus Ordo at all. Mm -hmm. He was sanctified perhaps in spite of the Novus Ordo, uh, certainly not because of it, and they have no business canonizing someone like that. Um, so, I mean, there's a, there's a whole list of those they've canonized. Um, as you know, as we call uh, John the Twenty Third, Paul the Sixth, and so on, is uh, proposed as pontiffs of the new order, which is what they are. They're, they're the pontiffs of the new order, so we'd call them saints of the new order if they made someone saints. As, as far as um, Bishop Sheen goes, I mean, he, he has quite a following, and I think justifiably so. But uh, toward the end of his life, when he was actually um, uh, being named a Bishop of Rochester, New York, um, he underwent a, a change. Something came over him. At first, with the Novus Ordo, he manifested a, a clear uh, discomfort with it, at least, and veiled criticism of it. But uh, as the Bishop of the uh, Nova Soto Diocese of Rochester, New York, I understand he invited Saul Alinsky to come to the diocese, the, the, the Marxist revolutionary, to stir up the, the faithful there. That is not, shall we say, an indication of sanctity, to invite a man like Saul Alinsky uh, to invite the wolf in, right, to snatch and tear the flock. Um, I was told by some of the Catholic people who lived through this period of time, with uh, Bishop Sheen taking over the diocese, uh, the leadership of the diocese uh, of Rochester, that he was sent away for re-education. And when he came back after the re-education, he was not the same. Uh, it's amazing. This is a part of the history of the Novus Ordo that is not often mentioned. But uh, when the new order came out with its new sacramental rites, especially its new mass, 
uh, there were tens of thousands of Catholic missionaries also who had to be re-educated and they were still practicing the traditional faith. They had to be called back in uh, from their mission fields in the, over the period of years and, and shall we say, indoctrinated with the Novus Ordo. Uh, this took uh, quite a bit of time to, they couldn't just, you know, call tens of thousands of missionaries throughout the world, whether they be, you know, Holy Ghost Brothers or uh, Jesuit, you know, missionaries and their missions or Dominicans and their missions. So they couldn't just call them in at once and have a big meeting and say, okay, we're going to do everything differently now. But you, from now on, just follow this book and just throw away everything else you did. It took time to impose this. And uh, we shouldn't be surprised that a, a Bishop Sheen would be uh, included in that necessity of indoctrination, too. Um, those who resisted the Novus Ordo, they, they had to be re-educated. And I tend to think that the, the camps of North Korea, uh, present North day North Korea, were probably not much more uh, brutal in their re-education <laughs> program uh, than the Novus Ordo, the modernists, mm -hmm. had been uh, all, all this time. So um, we see how they treat traditional Catholics even now, you know. And um, so, um, you know, I, I personally would pray for all of these people. I guess that's that's I guess that's the most telling answer I have at time. I would continue to pray for the repose of the soul of Bishop Sheen. Why? Because I'm not convinced that he you know is yet in heaven. I don't know that. And I, if the novice ever told me he was, I, that would not convince me uh, one bit. You know. Um, so they have the novice sort of saints as they call them. That doesn't deter me from praying for the repose of their souls and that they actually, um, you know, are granted admission to the light of glory. They, they receive the light of glory via admission, admitted to the beatific mission. So uh, the Nova Soto canonization process, I think they themselves have uh, made a mockery of the process. And I would say on the strength of that, that I would not say that that guarantees that somebody is in the beatific vision right now. Um, and some people ask, well, you know, what about John Paul II and John the Twenty-Third and so on? Well, I, I actually include, uh, I, I can pray. I mean, I do pray for them, you know. Um, and I, I pray for those who are living in the Novus Ordo, uh, the, even the leaders of the Novus Ordo. I pray them for their conversion to the Catholic faith. Um, so um, I would say we can pray for them. I would say if you had a veneration for them, uh, the Novus Ordo, those can, uh, can what should I say? Um, those uh, canonized by the Novus Ordo, I'd say if you really want to venerate them, pray for the repose of their soul, okay. and uh, pray for the. Uh, reparation for the insult, if they are in heaven now, pray in reparation for the insult of having been canonized by the Novus Ordo. Yeah. <laughs> Father, how, how do you explain this apparent contradiction within the Novus Ordo where, like you said, they will canonize these Novus Ordo pontiffs, these Novus Ordo modernist figures, a few more examples here, Edith Stein, Faustina, Kowalowska, Josephine Bakita, these m more modernist figures, they'll canonize them. But then at the same time, though, you know, we mentioned St. Teresa's parents, who are obviously very traditional, uh, Maximilian Colbe, Padre Pio, like you said, people yeah. like that. Why would they have, why, why would they do this, uh, where the world will canonize actual, real, traditional figures, but at the same time, these modernist, obviously modernist figures? Well, I don't think Edith Stein was an, an a modernist. Okay. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm not a great... Uh, I'm not an expert on Edith Stein or her writings, Edith Stein. Uh, I believe she was a heroic figure, and I believe she was a true Catholic. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, she was murdered by the Nazis, you know, uh, because of her Jewish parentage. Um, and 
Kowalski and his sister uh, Faustina. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, as far as I know, I, I, I don't know that I can pronounce on her apparitions. And she uh, was the one who, her, her writings were the origin of the Divine Mercy devotion that the Novus Ordo is using to um, obliterate the devotion to the Sacred Heart, okay? Um, but that wasn't Sister Faustina's work. That's the, what the Novus Ordo is doing yeah. to her. This is what the Novus Ordo is doing, making of her work, right? So, again, I mean, uh, Edith Stein and, uh, and um, uh, Sister Faustina and, 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 and the rest may well be saints in heaven today. I, I, don't, I can't canonize them myself, uh, even though I don't... I, I mean, I know of some heroic things that they've done, and I don't know of any reason that would exclude them from heaven. I don't know of any of their sins or other things, right? <laughs> Um, but I would say that uh, it, when it comes down to it, I can't canonize them, but I don't believe the Novus Ordo can either. Uh, now there are those the Novus Ordo wants to make uh, saints, like Dorothy Day, uh, who was an out-and-out -out supporter of Marxism and, uh, and Marxists, okay? Um, and I would say flatly that I do not believe that she, uh, well, I, I, I would definitely pray for the repose of her soul and ask that God have mercy on her. That's what I'm asking for there. But if the Novus Ordo were to, um, were to canonize someone like that, again, that would just be another uh, piece of evidence, a very strong piece of evidence in my mind, that their canonizations are a mockery of the whole idea of canonization. Catholic canonization. Okay. Father, we uh, received an interesting email from a uh, from a rector of an Anglican church. Mm -hmm. I don't withhold his name, obviously, but uh, he wrote them and said, I want to thank you for your program and Father Jenkins in particular for sharing his breadth of knowledge and experience in history, doctrine, and pastoral care. I always find myself encouraged and enlightened by the discussions. He says, I was wondering if you had any insight about Luisa Picaretta's teaching and a, uh, a, a bit of background, Father, we got from our, our research staff here. Um, it says here that at 17 years old, she had a mystical union with Jesus, after which she remained bedridden for the remainder of her life. While in bed, she wrote profusely while sustaining her body only on Holy Communion. Uh, three of her works, annotated by another person, were put on the Index of Forbidden Books. The rest of her writings were taken into custody by the Holy Office, where they remained sequestered until 1994. She wrote 36 volumes. Uh, these books were dictated to her by Jesus, apparently. Uh, it goes on a few more uh, a few more facts about her life, Father. But what what advice would you offer this uh, this Anglican rector? He says that he has a parishioner who's fascinated with with her teachings, and he's concerned about how to approach this parishioner of his. Well, I, I am not familiar with uh, Luisa Picaretta, mm -hmm. is that her name? Right. I'm not familiar with her writings. Uh, he says that, that her, well, someone says, her books were placed on the index. Right. Uh, this would have been, well, there was an index of forbidden in books. 1938. Back in 1938. Uh, there would have been a good reason for putting them on the index. That's, a, that's an index of forbidden books. Right. The Catholics were forbidden to read. And so... Um, that's an indication right there that there is something amiss here. I, as I say, I can't respond to this in any, in any mm -hmm. you know, the particulars of Luisa Picaretta. But it seems to me that people are, are looking for uh, you know, signs and wonders and extraordinary information. Um, and they think they can get them from these private apparitions. And that's a very big mistake. Um, because these things can be seriously abused. Um, I'm surprised this is an Anglican vicar, though. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess this uh, Louisa Picaretta was a Catholic. Is that it? Yes. Sir. She may well um, have had some kind of apparitions. I don't know. Uh, the without the church's declaration that. There is nothing contrary to the faith. 
involved, and these are uh, things are worthy of belief. That's as much, far as the church will go um, for private revelations. Okay, that there's nothing uh, contrary to the faith, and that these things are worthy of belief. Uh, it doesn't make them a matter of faith, though, for a Catholic to believe them as a, to be a Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, that is not the case here. Uh, with the, with the uh, books on the index of forbidden books, and having been uh, taken off the index and kind of rehabilitated only in 1994, uh, by, the, by the modernists. Yeah, 1994. Yeah, you know, this this does not bode well right. for <laughs> things here. Uh, now that being said, Louisa Picaretta might be in heaven right now, <clears throat> uh, but it's just that sometimes. Um, in illness, people could imagine things. Uh, it means that the devil himself could get in there and, and try to ins insinuate himself and his ideas. The church recognizes this, um, and that's why the church is very cautious about these things. And so uh, I would have to just, ur again, urge great caution about these things and not put faith in these matters. Mm -hmm. I, I think, Father, you, you hit the nail on the head when you said people are, are searching for all these these different, um, these, these, these private revelations. Yeah, they're running Garibandal and Medjugorje and all the rest. He, yeah, he actually mentioned that. He says that the, this, this particular parishioner is captivated by religious oddities. Mm -hmm. And he mentions a, mentions a few of those. You, you know, <laughs> these things are all, I, I believe that they are perpetrated by uh, the infernal powers to actually, on the one hand, uh, draw uh, credulous people away from the message of Fatima. I mean, it might seem as though some of these uh, apparitions, so-called, like uh, Bayside and Garibandal and Medjugorje and all the rest, <laughs> that they somehow reaffirm Fatima, but they always go off the rails somewhere along the line with strange phenomenon. <laughs> and uh, that then turn around when they when they do some very peculiar things, uh, they cast discredit uh, upon the past apparitions that the church has approved, such as Fatima, and uh, and ultimately wind up doing great harm. So um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, uh, what Our Lady had to say, she she had to say at Fatima. She didn't have to come back. Uh, you know, every two weeks and repeat it somewhere else, okay? To people who didn't really get it the first time. Uh, there's people, I, I've known of people who just run around the world dashing about, uh, finding the latest report of uh, not only where Our Lady supposedly appeared here, Our Lady supposedly appeared here, but looking for the picture of Our Lord in hot cross buns and looking for the picture of the Blessed Mother on a water tanks here and there. I mean, <laughs> it just reminds me of what our Lord says in St. Matthew chapter chapter 16 at the very beginning where it talks about signs and wonders. You know, a wicked and perverse generation demands the signs and wonders. Uh, but in the end, it is not... It is the Antichrist who will come performing the signs and wonders. And those who have a weakness for those things and a craving and a need and almost an addiction for these things are going to find that the, the signs and wonders are going to be coming from the wrong sources. I mean, like very misleading. Would you say that that applies to the uh, supposed apparition of Our Lady of Akita as well in 1973? Um, that I, I, I don't know. I, I know very little about that. Um, uh, frankly, I, I have not felt the need. I'm not one of those people who find, has a great need of chasing, as though chasing Our Lady and her appearances around the world, mm -hmm. as though she's on tour. There's just something about that that I find just unworthy. Um, uh, that, that doesn't mean that lady couldn't couldn't appear. I mean, she showed so it shows, right? But uh, again, I think the devil can make a mockery of Our Lady's message, and the way he will do that is by uh, repeating ninety nine percent of her message from Fatima, and then inserting again, you know, the the poison wherever he can to lead people astray. Again, the modern messages, I think, are largely directed toward uh, convincing the otherwise traditional Catholic people to stay with the Novus Ordo. I think the fundamental message of the modern uh, apparitions, uh, so-called apparitions, 
is, yes, things are terrible, and yes, the, the, the things are terrible in the church in particular. We have great worldliness, we have this, we have that, we have all these problems, but stay with it. You know, just uh, hang in there and be as conservative as you can be within the Novus Ordo, and all will be well with you. Um, that's, that's where I see these, these um, modern so-called apparitions uh, leading people astray mm -hmm. and keeping them from really going uh, to practice in, in its integrity of traditional Catholic faith. It's sort of keeping them on the... Well, in a sense, you know, Tom, the, the, the indult mass was introduced in the late 1980s, like in 1988, to do that, to keep the conservative Novus Ordo Catholics on the line and making them think that they can find, they can practice the traditional Catholic faith within the Novus Ordo. I think the Novus Ordo realized the Novus Ordo powers here on earth thought, well, we have to begin to give them, uh, throw them a bone, as it were, uh, because they must have detected a lot of serious unrest, especially when they, throughout the 1980s, were trying to work out some kind of an arrangement with Archbishop Lefebvre. And which in the end did not work out because the archbishop decided it, it was wrong, it just couldn't be. And he rejected that. But it got the hopes up. And I think that they were uh, afraid when the archbishop said, no, it's not possible to um, practice the Novus Ordo with a traditional faith within the Novus Ordo, at least at that time he said that, uh, in so many words, by rejecting that deal. Uh, I think they feared that they were going to lose a lot of people. And so uh, they decided, well, we want somebody in the traditional camp who will, who will accept the deal we were offering. And they got some priests and seminarians of Archbishop Lefebvre to accept the deal. And that's where the fraternity of St. Peter came from, mm -hmm. okay? But that's to keep the otherwise traditional Catholic Catholics on the Novus Ordo line within the Novus Ordo fold, and to give the Novus Ordo the veneer, the veneer of Catholicism. Yep. Um, and I think that's what these uh, modern apparitions do. I think they serve that same purpose for people who are very credulous and, uh, in a sense, uh, need, um, need something like this to keep them going. Uh, I think it's a sign, uh, my, in my own, in my own my, I think it's a sign of a weak faith that needs continual reassurance from heaven that, yes, all is well in the end. Father, you, you mentioned the apparition of Our Lady of Fatima. One of our viewers asked if that apparition was ever officially approved by the Church and if that is a matter that we must accept as a matter of faith or if that still has the status of a private revelation that we do not have to accept. Which Our, our Lady of Fatima. Of Fatima? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. The Church is has formally pronounced on that. So there's nothing in the uh, sayings uh, right, of, uh, attributed to Our Lady of Fatima that is contrary to the faith anyway. And not only that, but the Church has determined that it is worthy of belief. But are we forced to believe it? Must be are we to no, 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 one would not be a, uh, uh, considered to be a fallen away Catholic who, if the person did not believe in Fatima. Uh, if they believed that it was not a real apparition mm -hmm. of the Blessed Mother, I, you know, one might say it would be a bit rash to, to believe that, uh, to discount it out of hand. I know there are uh, very few traditional Catholics, I know of one in particular who did that. I'm hearing about someone else who I wouldn't consider a traditional Catholic who also questions Fatima because of something that Our Lady was supposedly wearing um, that she is saying is actually a, 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 a Muslim a Muslim symbol of some kind but um, there's no uh, I don't see anything substantive and the church itself pronounces nothing contrary to the faith okay. in Fatima okay.
Father, another question here in this same vein of Marian apparitions. This is uh, from a Catholic boy. He says that uh, he was speaking to one of his Protestant friends, and his friend implied that any Marian apparitions which prove Catholic beliefs, such as the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Immaculate Conception, were satanic in origin and should be disregarded. So he wants to know, is there really such a thing as a satanic apparition of the Blessed Virgin Mary? Oh, yeah. And there can be. I mean, Satan can adopt any form. He actually uh, can disguise himself as an angel of light, <clears throat> right? And um, I think I think he's done that at Medjugorje. I mean, there are, there are many, fan, I would say, fanatical devotees at Medjugorje. Um, that is that is basically their faith right now, Medjugorje. Um, uh, that's that's how deep it goes with them. Um, but I mean, I've heard accounts from Medjugorje that are very disturbing, and some of them are actually read out of books that are approved with, with regard to Medjugorje and, and the, 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 the apparitions there that supposedly give you the, the truth about it. In one case, in fact, uh, well, uh, you know, Our Lady was supposedly appearing in the forests, and the communists said this is very inconvenient, and uh, she's forbidden to appear there anymore. So she said, and so then she was going. To, she started appearing in the church, convenient, conveniently mm -hmm. enough, or at least very accommodating to the communists, of course. So um, she didn't want to uh, uh, inconvenience the communist overlords, so she began appearing in the church. And I understand she would even appear during the liturgy. And uh, the seer, at least one of them, would be up in the choir loft, uh, having a tete-a-tete -tete with the with the Blessed Mother, supposedly, while the liturgy was going down, down below, uh, in the nave of the church. And uh, you know, one account that I read said that uh, uh, this form began materializing before the seer. And when it suddenly burst into its final form, it was this horribly distorted, twisted face, which was frightening. And the seer actually sh screamed at the sight of it and turned away. And when she looked back, it was the, the Blessed Mother. Mm. Interesting. And she said, well, why did you scare me like that? And supposedly the Blessed Mother said, I just wanted to let you know that the devil can appear and in, in, in many different ways, you know. Um, now, that would be, I think, unique in the annals of uh, the Blessed Mother's um, appearances <laughs> in the history of the Church. <laughs> but there, there are a number of other very peculiar things, though. Um, not just peculiar, but just downright evil. Mm-hmm. So, um, yes, the devil can disguise himself. And in fact, he tries desperately to do so, you know. Even in his temptations, uh, he, he tries to uh, approach as our friend. He's the father of lies. He is the father of lies, yes. Father, father some, sometimes this topic comes up of uh, the Eucharistic miracles in, in the New Church. And you know, we've, I think we've talked about this before, where... Um, you know, there'll be some kind of supposed Eucharistic miracle where the host, the wafer, will turn into some kind of rotting flesh or something like this, and, and they'll rotting say... Rotting flesh? I've never heard of that. Okay. I mean, rare flesh, mm -hmm. yes, but the rotting part I hadn't. Okay. Not aware of any examples of that. Okay. That would be a very clear sign of something satanic if it were actually rotting flesh. Right. I think an, another example that I just uh, recently, I believe, was reading in South America, I believe it was, that there was a statue of Our Lady that was apparently shedding tears, mm -hmm. and the faithful there were flocking to that, and they were, um, y you know, they'll, they'll use this, things like this, as a, uh, it's kind of like you mentioned before, to say, look, everything is fine here, no sort of, we still have miracles, we have everything going on. But uh, the, the types of miracles these are, think about what, what would be the, the meaning of that? Our Lady shedding tears out, um, it seems that that would be... That would be open to interpretation, I would think. You know? Right, but it, it could easily be interpreted as, as the opposite of what they're right, trying right, to say. Right, exactly. Lady being upset yes. with, with what's going on. Yes, exactly. Well, there are a lot of stories about uh, statues shedding tears. And... Um, 
Uh, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that that has honestly happened uh, as, uh, as a result of heavenly intervention in the course of the Church's history. One has to be very, very wary of these things now, though, as you say, because they can be easily misinterpreted to draw a very wrong conclusion. Uh, when I was uh, a seminarian <coughs> um, out in California, there was a, a young man who worked at the, at the uh, seminary with his father, and uh, he was telling me about something that happened at a Novus Ordo church. Now, this would have been back again in the early 70s. It happened in a Novus Ordo church, I believe it would have been in Southern California. I think he was talking about something local. He said that a priest there, a Novus Ordo clergyman, uh, had been saying that I was certain, and we're using the linen cloth called the corporal, okay, that lies flat on the altar, and uh, it's called a corporal from the Latin word corpus, meaning body, because the host actually is consecrated on the corporal and lays on the corporal. It's a kind of symbolic of the shroud in which our Lord's body was laid and in which he rose from the dead. But uh, this young gentleman said that um, at one point during the liturgy, the priest uh, seemed to be jarred by something, and he actually held up the corporal for all to see, and it was tattered and torn and stained. And the young man said the people there present and the priest himself interpreted that to mean that... Um, the church herself is going through a period of suffering right now, but that this was God's way of saying, yes, I am still here with you at your Novus Ordo. Now again, I think objectively speaking, uh, one would look at that and say, that's a commentary from heaven to say, look what you're doing to me. Look what you're doing to my church. Look what you're doing to my, uh, myself, you know, in the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, to have the corporal all torn up and tattered and stained and, you know, um, you think they get the idea we shouldn't be doing this you know this is God's commentary on what we're doing here with the Novus Ordo they took it exactly the opposite <coughs> as though this is an endorsement of the Novus Ordo and the blindness is really quite impressive and alarming so one has to be very careful of these so called signs and wonders our Lord said that in the end it was the Antichrist and, and Saint, uh, Saint Paul says this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He talks about the Antichrist coming, working signs and wonders, which are so impressive that he could even deceive the chosen souls of God. So we've got to be very wary of these things, because the devil will try to use them sure. uh, against souls and against their salvation. So, um, Rather than be chasing them down, um, we should be looking rather askance at them and very wary of them because we don't have the voice of the church reliably telling us that yes, this is, this is truly from heaven and this is definitely not. Right. Father, with that, I will let you go. I know you have other engagements tonight. Real quick, I, I did want to mention with our, uh, our recent discussion about the Alfie Evans case, the, uh, it was reminiscent of the Terry Schiavo situation several years back when we had uh, a few requests um, for the letter that you wrote concerning that topic. We've actually yeah. posted that to our blog. We can attach the link here. Oh, to, that, was, uh, that was entitled The Execution of Terry Scheibel. Mm -hmm. yep. And um, I, think, I think that all still applies. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yes, I, I, I'm glad. I appreciate you mm -hmm. taking care of that, Tom, and making that available. And our staff here at but Catholics Relief also posting that for me. Yeah, definitely. And feel free to comment on that and add anything else you might know if you come across other information, too, that's helpful. Mm -hmm. There were, uh, I mean, Terry Scheibel's circumstances were very different from those of Malvi Evans and uh, Charlie Gard and so on. Well, those, the latter two were just little children who were done to death. But uh, nonetheless, the whole idea of actually um, uh, their, their lives being expendable. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the message is there that 
Well, uh, they they really would be better off dead. That's that's the claim. You know, <laughs> and as soon as you get the government officials or anyone else deciding that, or, or medical officials saying, well, this person would be better off dead, you've got a serious serious problem, a grave moral problem, <laughs> and. Um, you know, sometimes people would ask, even during the Tyree Shaiho ordeal, back in the early 200s, or 2000s, I'm sorry, late 200s, I'm talking about the days of my youth, the early 2000s, well, would you want to live like that? Would you want to live like that? Well, of course, what, is, what a silly question. You know, they, they ask these silly questions, and they, they make people step back and think, oh, gee, no, I wouldn't want to live like that, as though they made a good point as though, you know, they're on the right track. But you know, we, we hear these questions and we should immediately cut through them um, because they're, 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 they're nonsense questions. And of course you wouldn't want to live like that, and I wouldn't want to live like that at all. But if the question is, would you rather be murdered than live like that, the answer is, of course not. You know, uh, I, if I, I would rather not live like that, and I wouldn't want to live like that, um, but if it was God's will, I would accept it. I certainly would not uh, call for my murder <laughs> by you, and it certainly wouldn't justify you murdering me. <laughs> and besides that, even if I, uh, even if I would, that doesn't give me the right to say, "Well, go murder everybody in the world you think wouldn't want to live." Uh, you know, is living something a way that you wouldn't want to live? You know, you decide uh, who's living a kind of life that you wouldn't want to live, and you, that gives you a license to go kill them. Is that what you're saying? Is that the message you're giving us? Um, and ultimately, that, that's actually what is implied in that, in that silly question. So, um, we have to be able to uh, cut through these things, actually, in two ways, if I can just sum, kind of sum up a little bit in what we've said here earlier. You know, there, there are things we have to be able to cut through the silliness of, okay? And that is the devil of smoke screens with these really silly questions um, that are so silly, they're almost stunning. And that's the point, you know, they, they, you have to uh, intellectually find your way through them and identify, you know, the fallacies involved in them because they're so ridiculous. And they're, they're implying things that are so false. But with temptation, we have to do the same thing, because it, the temptation comes from the devil, too. Temptation to us individually. You mentioned the, you know, the devil disguising himself as an angel of light. You mentioned the angel can, uh, the devil can even disguise himself as our blessed mother if he wanted to. Even appear as our Lord. If our Lord would allow him to. Yes, of course, he'd be very uh, happy to do that. If he thought he could if he thought he could, uh, uh, you know, cost uh, souls the divine life of grace, then yes, certainly he would. Um, but he will come to us also in, in temptation for our souls, and he will try to make everything sound really good. And whatever his temptations are, I mean, he'll, he'll be giving us all kinds of justifications for these things, whether they're temptations of impurity, temptations to anger and hatred, and temptation to dishonesty and lying and cheating and stealing. He always comes with his handbook of a thousand and one handy excuses. Why, I can justify this in my own mind. Uh, we have to be able to cut through all that. And um, as I said in the last program, just because the thought comes to our minds, we, we can't just say, well, it's my thought, so it must be right. That's pride speaking. And we have to get to the point where we scrutinize and test spirits you know, and realize uh, one thing that I, I think would, is helpful for people, if they're able to, uh, when, they, when they get a temptation that comes to them, from Satan suggesting something and the trying to dress it up and make it look as though, uh, in this case, this would be okay. I think they have to disguise it. I have to, I have to tear off the disguise, and they have to tell themselves, as I said before, this is a really dumb idea. This is a stupid idea. And uh, there are people who fight temptations 
But, I, I, you know, there are some kinds of temptations you do not directly fight because it just focuses your mind on them to fight them. Like you'd focus on an enemy you're in combat with. And there are some kinds of temptations that's a very serious mistake to do. And so to dismiss the temptations of Satan by, in, your, in our own mind, saying this is, a, this is a dumb thing, this is a real stupid idea, especially if it's an idea of impurity, to really uh, just denounce it as something really stupid that I would want nothing to do with. As I mentioned, I think in the last program, the devil finds this very hard to take. He's willing to be called any number of things, but he doesn't want to be called stupid, okay, because of his intellectual pride. And um, this does, this, this wounds him more deeply than virtually anything else, to say that the, what he's suggesting is stupid, and we reject it as something absolutely stupid. Um, I'm sorry, but um, it might offend some people. I know I'm going on here, I beg your pardon. It might offend some people when I use that word stupid, but in sacred scripture, when Samuel, the last great judge of Israel, told Saul, Saul, the king, what he'd done in presuming to go ahead and offer sacrifice without Samuel coming in. I mean, he was the one authorized by God to offer the sacrifice. When Samuel was late in coming, and Saul got cold feet because the Philistines were forming up their battle lines, <clears throat> Saul went ahead and did it himself. And you know what Samuel said to him? You did this stupidly. That's the expression he used. He said, it was stupid for you to do this. And uh, there's, there's very little that, that wounds someone, a proud man, more deeply than that. And St. Thomas Aquinas, when he was... When he was talking about uh, the formation, the creation of the world, he actually referred to the position of the pantheists as uh, stultissime, said most stupidly they claim this. <laughs> so it is, it is not outside the Catholic vocabulary. And if this is what actually offends a, uh, a proud man, okay, whose pride has led him to do something, really wrong, then imagine how, how it wounds the proud, angelic uh, intellect sure. of Satan. So uh, I, I don't want to scandalize people by using that word and not using it uh, rashly, but advisedly according to its strict meaning, <laughs> okay, and according to the Latin word stulte, which means stupidly, uh, <clears throat> there, there are uh, great figures in history have actually used the word wisely uh, and aptly. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, that too will, can, be, can be used to one's advantage when called for <laughs> by temptation. Uh, so I'll turn, the, turn everything over to you so you can wrap things up. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> I appreciate your time. No. All right. Thanks to all of our viewers as well for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady of Fatima, to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, to pray and do penance. Thank you, and God bless you.